Hello, everyone. Come on in. Feel free to ask me questions while we're waiting for everybody else. It's actually time for class to start, but uh, like I said, we, we only have like five people in here, so uh, we just need to wait for more people to show up. Oh, we're up to seven already. Woohoo! We got eight of you now. No questions for me. This is time for you to answer question, ask questions about uh, upcoming tests, about past homework, about homework that's coming up due. Uh, I do have a question about the uh, homework. Yeah, John. Uh, so I was curious. I got um a I got a good score on one of my homework uh, right before it was due. Uh huh. But I want to go back. I want to go back and redo it. Would there be a late penalty if I do redo it after the late after the uh, original due date? I don't know, but do this. Uh, take a screenshot of your grade. Make sure it shows your name and what assignment it is. Take a screenshot of that and hold it. And if it does change it, I'll go. Uh, you can just send me that, and I'll change it back to that. Because I, I certainly want want to encourage you guys to keep doing it after it's due. Yep. Okay. So, right, and, I'll do that. Everybody should do that. <laughs> Anybody that wants okay. to do the homework after it's due, I, I it shouldn't. It should give you the highest that you got at any time. Uh, assuming you complete it now, if you did it and like left one blank and then you went and redid it after the due date, it might count the whole thing wrong. And I can see where that's somewhat justifiable, though I, I wouldn't choose to do it that way. But other than that, it, it, you know, I would think it's not going to do that. Hopefully it wasn't, won't. <laughs> uh, Hannah just asked about the exam schedule. Uh, I have the exam schedule to some extent uh, in our syllabus. So a lot of times those online test dates will change. Uh, as far as I can tell, the actual face-to-face -face test will not change. And uh, basically the, the first face-to-face -face test will happen during lab. And it depends on what day of the week your lab meets. But from January 30th to February 5th, if your lab is one of those days, then that's when your test one will be whichever one of those days falls in that time period, January 30th to February 5th. Your second face-to-face -face will be February 27th to March 11th. And your third will be April 2nd to April 8th. And that's like the only way we can set it up that way because we have the same classes uh, using the same labs and all that stuff. And, you know, because we missed a couple Mondays, the Monday lab is often uh, as much as a, at least a week, but sometimes two weeks behind the Tuesday lab, Wednesday lab, Thursday lab, and Friday lab. So that's that's why it's listed that day uh, that way. I'll give you those dates again in case you want to uh, copy them down. So January 30th to February 5th is test one, January 30th, February 5th. So that's 130 to 25. The next one is 227 to 311. 227 to 311. 227 to 311. And the third uh, midterm is 42 to 48. That's 42 to 48. So hopefully that'll help you. Uh, the actual face to, I mean, the actual online tests, they're pretty much as set up in the, uh, in the schedule and the syllabus. I'll just say that I don't, I know I made one mistake and put one like a week too early. So you might be that one. I can't recall, but the way we've got it, I've got it set up right now is you have an online test that I opened up. Uh, I want to say Tuesday, I opened up the practice test, uh, Tuesday or Monday night or something like that. And the actual tests now, 
is also open and you have your class for some reason i set it on the 30th instead of the 29th it was supposed to be the 29th i got ready to change it and i was like nah i'll just give you guys the extra day to do it so your first online test which remember it allows you open book open notes uh even open internet but usually you uh, have a limited amount of time. And ideally what I'd like to do is make the time where you can easily look up one problem that you might've forgotten how to do and not run out of time. But if you have to look up more than that during the test, then you're uh, honestly shooting yourself in the foot. So uh, if you're finding that you're doing that and I've given you enough time to do that, uh, just try to avoid it because you really not doing yourself any favors you're going to do worse on the on the actual face-to-face -face test but anyways that's the way it's set up so that you can actually do searches and take the nerves out of it and all that good stuff uh the only thing you're supposed to not do is you're not supposed to uh find out any information that came straight from the test so i tell you don't look at any websites uh that have been created since the day i opened it up which i think was 122 so uh, any websites created since then, you're not supposed to look at. You're not supposed to talk to students that's already taken it, at least not about that test. You're not supposed to read it, notes of a student that's already taken it, at least any notes that happen to be anything about that test, that kind of stuff. But other than that, you're completely free to Google it uh, using Chegg or whatever. So any other questions about that? That sufficient for you there, Hannah? All right, so do remember you have you have a face excuse me an online test due uh, that it's going to be due on the thirtieth, so that's like Tuesday of this week at eleven fifty nine p.m. I meant it to be due Monday night, which is the 29th, but I, I set it the thirtieth by for some reason. So you have until the thirtieth. Uh, the first face to face test, depending on uh, I got to figure out what day your lab. What day is your lab, by the way? Those of you who have the, the normal lab that comes with this lecture. Tuesday. It's Tuesdays. Okay, so with the Tuesday one, I think that means the 29th wouldn't be it. So that wouldn't be this week uh, coming up. It's going to be the following week. So yeah, you guys will actually have another practice test that includes chapter 19. So your first face-to-face -face test will be at least 17, 18, and 19. Some of my classes like have it first thing this Monday, and I haven't completed chapter 19. So uh they'll either get nothing of 19 or maybe a small part of 19. So just keep that in mind. Anything else? So please, please, please don't forget the uh, online test that's coming up. Anybody have any other questions about anything? All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and start back up in uh, chapter 19. We have essentially done uh, between the what the book has as examples and between the examples I worked, I think you've had ample opportunity to figure out how to do calorimetry problems. Uh, but I still wanted to work one more. And in fact, I, I tell you what I did. I did one of one type for my class that meets at three o'clock uh, or excuse me, at two o'clock on Mondays and uh, Wednesdays. My 242 class that meets uh, two o'clock on Mondays and Wednesdays. I did one type of calorimetry problem. And this class, I'm going to do a different type of calorimetry problem. So I'm recommending to them that they watch the beginning of, of your video, which is going to be recorded right now. And I recommend to you to watch the beginning of their video, which would have been recorded yesterday at 2 p.m. So I definitely suggest you guys do that just to give you more examples. Uh, if you're completely content with seeing examples that are just worked in your book or ones you can find yourself online or on my YouTube channel, then that's fine. But I, I just say uh, I just want to let you know that's what you should be doing uh, to help you get, you know, a little bit more experience with calorimetry. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start that now. And then I'm going to jump in from uh, calorimetry to thermodynamic processes and the first law of thermodynamics, which is really just another type of statement of the conservation of energy. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Feel free to ask me questions while I'm waiting for all this to work. You'll see both the problem that I worked in, in my class yesterday at 2 p.m. 
Uh, remember, it'll be 242, and then it'll say 124 or 01242024 uh, because that was the date. So that's all you have to look for, and you'll find the right one uh, being 242 and on that date. Uh, but both in that case and today, now I forgot what I was saying about it. Poop. Okay. Anyways, uh, those calorimetry problems are helpful. I can't remember what I was getting ready to say about it, but anyways, oh yeah, yeah, I remember. So they, they very much are like ones that your book did. Uh, I more or less mirrored them, but that's also more or less the nature of physics is all the problems are sort of pretty much the same. And the same thing's true about yours here. It's it's just like one. You'll see the wording and the numbers are different, but it's it's really pretty close. So if you're having any problems reading this cursive, uh, you can always revert to that. Hopefully everybody can, to some extent, read cursive, uh, mainly because it takes so much more time to write and handwritten script as opposed to cursive so i'm going to read this to you uh this is our first example that we're going to work uh regarding calorimetry today anyways and then the other examples will be related to other stuff so here's the example and it says in an attempt to determine the specific heat of a new alloy a 0 0.200 kilogram sample is heated to 500 degrees celsius the hot sample is quickly placed in a 0 0.450 kilogram uh, in 0 0.450 kilograms of water in thermal equilibrium with the 0 0.200 kilogram aluminum calorimeter cup at 12 degrees Celsius. So what I'm saying there is the cup and the water in it have been left sitting still uh, away from heat sources and stuff like that for a long period of time and a thermometer was in there and eventually the thermometer came to rest and it came to rest at 12 degrees celsius which indicates that both the cup and the water uh the aluminum cup and the water both have a temperature of 12 degrees celsius so that's what i mean by that convoluted sort of sentence there uh the final equilibrium temperature is 31.3 degrees celsius and we're supposed to use that to find the specific heat of the alloy Anybody have any questions on the wording of that or anything they don't understand about how that work, how this problem is explained? Okay, so uh, I'm going to use my normal technique that I recommend, which is Q lost equals Q gained. What we want to know is the specific heat of the alloy which i'll just say c sub a equals question mark i do know that the specific heat of aluminum is 900 uh, joules per kilogram celsius degree and the specific heat of water is 4,186 joules per kilogram Celsius degree. I know that the initial temperature of the alloy is actually going to be 500.0 degrees Celsius. So that's an I with a subscript A there. I also know that the final temperature of the alloy is going to be 31.3 degrees Celsius. I also know that the initial temperature of the water and the aluminum is 12.0 degrees Celsius. And the final temperature, whoa, and the final temperature of the water and the aluminum is equal to 31.3 degrees Celsius. And I think that's, oh, I also have the masses, which I can uh, pull in in a second. So what I'm going to do is realize the only thing in this problem, well, actually, let's, let's let you guys figure this out. Can anybody tell me what is gaining heat? What is gaining heat? by this process that I explained. 
Let me open up the chat. I realize I don't have that open now. So I'm going to open up the chat window. There it is. Nobody type anything else? All right. The water. the water is gaining heat, yes. Is there anything else? Ah. Um, Micah said it as well. It's the water and the... That's the thing. Uh, and that's why I tried to uh, stress to you that we put the water in the aluminum cup and we waited till the water and the cup reached equilibrium by noticing that the thermometer would have been sitting in the water. And as long as the water temperature and the uh, cup temperature were different, the thermometer temperature would change. And then once it stopped changing, that meant that they were the same temperature. So uh, that's what's going on there. So yes, it's those two. And the only thing, of course, uh, losing heat is the alloy. So I'm going to take the alloy, which is 0 0.200, and I'm going to leave off the units here. However, it's really, really sort of important for you to track units. So I'll be thinking about units. I'm just not writing them down, and I'm not doing that specifically because of, you know, room on this little pad. So I'm going to say 0 0.200. That's the actual mass of the sample. And the specific heat of the sample is CA. And remember, when I use Q loss equals Q gained, I have to have all the terms positive. So I need big temperature minus uh, small temperature, period. I don't want final minus initial necessarily. So uh, when we look at the aluminum, the initial temperature of 500 degrees Celsius is quite a bit hotter than the final temperature. So I'm going to put T initial minus T final are 500.0 minus uh, 31.3. So that's MC delta T for the aluminum. And that's the only thing losing heat. Does everybody follow what I did there? Okay. And in fact, I can at least do some of the arithmetic. 500 minus 31.3 gives us 468.7. Uh, and actually, technically, I should write that as Celsius degrees since it's a subtraction. And then, of course, I'm going to multiply that by 0.2. Now, we also have the water. And the water is 400 and, or 0.450 kilograms. So I'm going to write 0 0.450 times the specific heat of water, which is 4186. And again, the delta T term has to be positive. So I'm going to take big number minus small number. And what we know is the water starts off at 12 and it ends up at 31.3 so i'm gonna have to do 31.3 minus 12.0 okay and i can do that arithmetic too 31.3 minus 12.0 and that gives me 19.3 okay so i got that now we also have the aluminum cup, so I'm going to put a plus, and now I got to take the mass of the aluminum cup, which is 0 0.2. Uh, be, be, be. oh yeah, they're the same way. 0 0.200 times the specific heat of aluminum, which I happen to know is about 900 joules per kilogram per Celsius degree. And it's going to have the same delta T as the water. So I'm going to write 31.3 minus 12.0. Now, what I have to do is I have to take that 0.2 and multiply it by 468.7. And then I got to multiply that by CA. Notice when I multiply the 0.2 times 468.7, that 0.2 would have been grams, or excuse me, kilograms, and the uh, temperature would have been degrees Celsius. So basically the answer is 93.74. And that is uh, kilograms 
Actually, it's kilograms times Celsius degrees. Like that. And uh, all that times C of the alloy. Now, uh, notice the alloy would have units of joules per kilogram Celsius degree. So you see when they multiply, that'll actually give you joules. So everything looks like it's working unit-wise right now. Now I've got to take the 0.450 and multiply it by 4186. And then I got to multiply that by 19.3. And another student came in. Okay, so when I multiplied those, I got 36,355.41. I'm just going to go 36,355. Uh, and just round it off there, even though I've still got more sig figs and it's really reasonable. Notice in that case, I had to 0.45, which was kilograms, the 4186, which is joules per kilogram Celsius degree, and then the Celsius degree. So this whole answer just comes out in joules. And in fact, I only had three sig figs. So these two guys are extra sig figs. Uh, the same thing with the 93.74, I only had three sig figs. Uh, when I subtracted, notice the 46, uh, the 500.0 minus 31.3 did allow me to have, uh, basically four sig figs on that one, but the three and the 0.2, uh, is what limited me here. That takes care of that term. Now I'm going to take the 0.2 times the 900 and then multiply that times the 19.3 as well. And again, I get three sig figs, but this time the figure is going to be uh, 3474, which is one extra sig fig than, than we're allowed. Okay, so now I've got everything in the appropriate units. I'm going to take that 3474 and I'm going to add it to the 36,355. And that gives me 39,829. So 39,829, it looks like when I added those two, I can only go to the nearest uh, hundreds place, or excuse me, to the nearest tenths place as a result of the 36,000 number, whereas I could go to the, uh, oh, actually, no, I can only go to the hundreds place according to the 36,000. So I really have to round off two of these. So I only have uh, three sig figs on this one. And that's equal to 93.74 kilograms Celsius degree times the specific heat of aluminum, excuse me, of the alloy. So the specific heat of the alloy should be that number 39829 divided by 93.74. And we see we got three sig figs divided by three sig figs. That gives me 424.9. That's one extra sig fig. And that turns out to have units of joules per kilogram Celsius degree. And that should be the answer. Anybody have any questions on that? Thank you, Shonda. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. And like I said, all the calorimetry problems can be done with the uh, basically the idea that all the things losing heat are all going to only contribute positive terms on the left hand side, and all the things gaining heat are only going to contribute positive terms on the right hand side, or vice versa. That's fine. But the main thing is that they're all positive terms. You got to force that. And in doing so, that allows you to use the heat of vaporization, the heat of fusion, the heat of sublimation as much as you need without having to, you know, bother your brain about whether the L should be positive or negative in your particular case. So that's really the whole reason I do all of that that way. Uh, and, and basically, I, I remember one time sort of getting freaked out and screwing up uh, in the stress of a test. So I've just stuck to it all this time. 
So we've done uh, late heat. I talked about the little scale. I'd made a temperature versus uh, heat added scale for one kilogram of water. Uh, that showed you sort of how uh, matter goes through its different states and stuff like that. So now I want to move on to the next part of what we're talking about. Your book does do some discussion of evaporation and stuff like that. And earlier, I think it was chapter 18, they also gave us a difference between vapor and gas. So uh, that's a worthwhile thing to commit to memory. Of course, as is are the all uh, are all the uh, bold face terms that you see in your textbook. So definitely, as you're going through your chapter, if you see a bold face term, you should write that down and make sure you define it, uh, because that's something you need to be able to do or know. It comes up in conceptual questions, and sometimes it just comes up in your ability to solve problems. If you don't know the difference between a vapor and a gas, uh, sometimes that could be the difference in you solving a problem and not being able to solve a problem. So uh, definitely pay attention to your reading, that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm going to go on to the first law of thermodynamics. And what I want to uh, talk to you about is what the total internal energy is. <laughs> Hold on a second. All right. So uh, the the first law of thermodynamics is going to be a, a, an equation that gives us what could possibly affect the internal energy of any system. So when you're doing uh, physics, and especially the physics of thermodynamics, you're always given some freedom in choosing what your system is. <laughs> so I keep using this vague term system, uh, and I, I want you to understand what that means. Uh, for instance, in the last problem, we could have thought of the system as just the water. <laughs> or we could have thought of the, just the system as just the alloy block that we dropped in the water. Or we could have thought of the system as the alloy block and the water. Or we could have thought of the system as the alloy block, the water, and the aluminum uh, calorimeter cup that was in. That was ultimately what we did was treat all that as the system but you did have some freedom there. The difference being, though, if you'd chosen, for instance, the water to be one system, then you'd have a what, what's called a non-adiabatic process because what happened when you put the hot alloy inside of the water is an environmental thing, i.e. the alloy, which wasn't part of the system, has now applied heat to your system. And since heat is being applied to your system, it can't be adiabatic because adiabatic means uh, without a heat transfer. So there are some times where that's helpful to do it, but you, you don't have to. And in, th in this case, it really would not have been wise to try to do it as, as if that's a separate system. Uh, it also would have been unwise to try to treat the water as a separate system from the calorimeter cup because then you have yet another uh, uh environmental thing that was robbing you of heat uh you could also have problems of you know them robbing you of work and more stuff to keep up with but that is something that has to go on over and over again so i'll repeatedly talk about systems so uh the first thing i need you to understand before you can make sense of the first law of thermodynamics is i need you to understand that the internal energy is the sum total of all of the energy of all of the molecules in the object. So if you if you say that your system is an object, maybe it's a, a certain volume of gas that's in a container. The container might be part of the system too. That all depends on how you set it up, but it could just be the gas as well. So if it's just the gas, then the total internal energy would be the sum total of all the ty types of energy that the molecules have in that gas so that means uh translational kinetic energy which is what we use to determine temperature remember the uh the temperature is basically the average random kinetic energy per molecule basically of uh the molecules in the substance and you have basically the average kinetic energy equal to three half kt but that kinetic energy is just the translational kinetic energy of the molecules. 
but there's more energy than that. You might actually have a molecule that's spinning this way. That's not translational. So if the molecule's spinning about some axis, there's energy associated with that. If it's spinning about another axis, there's energy associated with that. Uh, there's also the fact that a molecule could bump, bump into another molecule and cause, for instance, one of the electrons in one of its founding atoms could be bumped up to a higher level or a higher orbital. That means one of the atoms in the molecule is now in an excited state, so it has a greater potential energy than it had before. That's another energy that has to be included in the internal energy. Uh it could be a uh, atom made with radioactive nuclei, in which case you've got, you know, a nucleus that changes energy states each time it decays. Uh, you've got to take into account all those types of energy. You've got molecules, uh, if they're in a solid, for instance, you've got molecules that are set a certain distance apart to make the lattice of their solid, and uh that is reminiscent of a specific potential energy due to the electric force of attraction between one molecule and the next. So that's another type of energy. So all those different types of energy, as well as the chemical energy associated with the bonding of the molecule, for instance, uh, gasoline that you use in your car or diesel fuel that you might use in your car, uh, that has a bonding energy between carbon and each of the other atoms in the molecule. So all of those are types of energy you have to take into account. But that sum total of all those different energies is what we call the internal energy. So now that you have that, you can think, okay, well, what happens if I put heat into my system? Now, I have to define heat for you. And I do, I do have a list of definitions that I went ahead and wrote out for you guys on subsequent pages, but they're already written out. Of course, they are in cursive, so that's a bit of a problem. Uh, but still, we I, I do have that. But heat is basically what we recognize as a uh, energy being transferred, or it's energy in motion, if you will, due specifically to a temperature difference. So heat flows as a result of a temperature difference. So if two things are in thermal contact with each other and they have different temperatures, the hotter, higher temperature thing is... Uh, basically expelling heat and that heat is being absorbed for the colder lower temperature thing and that's a transfer of energy so heat is really just a transfer of energy due to uh, a difference in temperature so if we actually think of applying heat to a system you might think what could happen if i actually put heat in a system is it possible that the internal energy of the system could go down Or how about this? Is it likely that when I put heat into a system, the system's internal energy will go up? Is that reasonable? Sounds reasonable to me. Yeah, and it's and that's where the first term in this in uh the first law of thermodynamics comes from. So you got delta E internal equals Q. And I'm telling you that Q is really supposed to be Q added. So that means Q is a positive if heat comes into the system. Okay. That's why the sign between the equals and the Q is positive. Now, the other thing is what about if my system does some work? Okay. If my system does some work, is that likely to result in an increase in the internal energy of the uh, system? Or is that likely to result in a decrease in internal energy of the system? Remember, the system is doing work. Decrease? Yeah, it should decrease. Because you can imagine work is really a transfer of energy via mechanical means. So, uh, uh, for instance, uh, pushing up of a piston or something like that. So if you have your system thinking of it like as a, a, a volume of gas, then it doing work would mean like, hey, this volume of gas is pushing against a piston and causing the volume to get larger. 
the only way it can do that is uh, by giving away some of its internal energy to make that work happen. So yeah, that should be a decrease. And that's why we've got the minus W uh, after the Q. Does that make sense? So don't sweat it if you're fresh out of a chemistry class or maybe even taking a chemistry class right now. You probably use delta E internal or you probably use U for it instead. But the main thing is you normally use uh, internal energy is equal to Q plus W in chemistry. But in physics, we use Q minus W because physics, when we first started studying the first law of thermodynamics, a lot of our work was doing stuff like James Prescott Joule was doing. Uh, which was and, and subsequent people that worked on uh, heat engines. And when you're doing that, the most important parameter for a heat engine is how much work you get out. So they were used to using the work put out of a system, and therefore you had to put a minus in front of the W. So with that in mind, you can see uh, Q is the heat added to the system, and W is the work done by the system. And therefore, the first law of thermodynamics says that the change in internal energy is equal to Q minus W. So that's the normal way we use it. But we often find that it's uh, useful to use in like a differential format. So if you look to the right of that, you'll see I have a DE internal. That's a differential change in internal energy. And you'll notice that's equal to something that's not quite the same. Notice I have Ds with little bars on it with the Q and the W. The reason being is uh, Q is not what we call a state variable, neither is W. State variables are variables that uh, can be used to determine the state of a system. And if you look, for instance, at a volume of gas, there's no way to tell whether that volume of gas was recently heated up from some heat source or whether it was uh, had some of its internal energy increase because of some work done on it or anything like that, because those things don't leave lasting marks. However, if you had the pressure and the volume and the number of moles then you can use an equation of state to figure out what the temperature is. Therefore, those variables, pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature, are all state variables. And those are the types of things that can have a D in front of them. When you have a D in front of something, that literally means that that could be a differential. It could be DE internal is equal to the partial derivative of E internal with respect to pressure times depressure plus the partial derivative of E internal with respect to volume times D volume plus the partial derivative of E internal with respect to temperature times D temperature. You can't say that with DQ. There's no Q as a function of pressure or a function of vo uh, volume or a function of temperature, nor can you say that with W. So those D bars are just represented, uh, are used to represent a very small amount of heat added or a very small amount of work being done. Whereas on the other side, it's literally a differential that could be integrated. Does that make sense? Or can you at least understand what I'm saying? Until you apply it, there's not much meaning to that, but the main thing is I wanted you to understand why we have those difference of symbols. All right. So notice I also gave you a sign convention. Q is less than zero if heat is extracted from the system, and work is less than zero if work is done on the system. So as an example, let's consider this. 3,000 joules of heat is added to an ideal gas, and 2,000 joules of work is done in compressing the gas in its cylindrical container, i.e. via a piston. What is the change in internal energy of the system? So that's the question we're trying to ask here. And obviously, we've been given a heat and a work, and what we want to use is the first law of thermodynamics, which says the change in internal energy is equal to Q minus W, where Q equals heat added to 
two cysts and W is work done by the system, which I'm uh, shortening or abbreviating, if you will. Okay, so we know that. So can someone tell me, it says 3,000 joules of heat is added to an ideal gas. So what would you say Q is? Three thousand joules of heat is added to an ideal gas, and two thousand joules of work is done in compressing the gas. What is Q? Yes, and specifically, it's positive three thousand. Uh, you did say. 3,000, that means positive, but I just want to make sure everybody realizes the, the big point here is you've got to know whether it's a positive Q or a negative Q. And since it's explicitly said heat is added to, okay, since it said that, you know the Q is positive. What about the W? Yes, Manka. Yes, the W has to be negative 2,000 joules because this one says work is done in compressing. So compressing the gas means work is done on the gas. You can think of it this way. Uh, if you think of the work being done and it results in an increase in uh, internal energy of the system, then clearly that work has to be negative because the negative with the negative makes it positive, and that's the only way you can get uh, E internal to increase. So hopefully that helps you or whatever you figured out helps you. So now we can say delta E internal is equal to Q minus W, which is equal to 3,000 joules minus negative 2,000 joules, which equals 5,000 joules. Any questions on that? So that's essentially like the world's easiest first law of thermodynamics problem. Any questions? All right. Well, let's move on to the next thing. So uh, what I want to tell you is, uh, and I've already mentioned this before, the first law of thermodynamics really is a statement of conservation of energy. It just says energy is neither created nor destroyed. Uh, of course, we have to add a little caveat to that because you guys uh, who had me for 241 at least were somewhat exposed to special relativity. Uh, even though I didn't get to cover the chapter, I did talk about it in a couple of different spots. But what we learned in relativity is E equals MC squared tells you that matter uh, can disappear and reappear as a certain amount of energy. And that energy would be given by the mass that disappeared times C squared. Similarly, energy E could actually disappear at the uh, same time that mass actually does appear in which case that mass would be the energy divided by the square of the speed of light. So uh, the modern statement of the conservation of energy is that mass energy is neither created nor destroyed because we do allow mass to convert to energy and energy to convert to mass. And not only that, that E equals MC squared is true in every, every, every type of energy. So for instance, when you, uh, when you burn the gas that you pour in your car, that you put in your car, you can sort of think of let's let's take a brand new car that's never been run. It's completely clean, never been had any gas put through it or anything like that. And we take and uh, weigh exactly how much gasoline we put in the car. We know exactly to, you know, 480 decimal places. We know exactly the mass of gas that we put in the car. 
And then we drive the car and we do a very precise calculation determination of exactly how much energy the gas provided for the car, right? And we keep doing that until all the gas is gone. And not only that, we have the car set up in such a way that it catches all the exhaust and that we can, uh, in fact, pull out all the exhaust from the exhaust train, uh, any leftover stuff inside the carburetor, all that stuff. And when we're all done with all that and we weigh the gasoline that we originally put, now we take and weigh all the exhaust fumes that came out of the back of the tailpipe, all the exhaust stuff that was laid inside the exhaust system of the car, all the residue in the pistons, all the residue in the carburetor, all that stuff. When we add up all those masses, it turns out that that mass will be a little bit less than the mass of the gasoline in the tank. So remember, we put a certain amount of gasoline in the tank and we knew it to any number of decimal places. What we just discovered was unlike uh, Priestley's experiment where he discovered that basically the mass of all the ash and stuff from the burn added up to the same mass of the original thing he burnt. That is not the case. He just didn't have a, a good enough procedure to pull it off or good enough technology to pull it off. So when you actually burn fuel in a car, you actually could catch all the exhaust and all that stuff. And you would still come up with a little bit less mass than you put into it. And it turns out that the amount of mass you're missing is exactly equal to all that energy that was derived from the gasoline divided by C squared. And that would give you exactly how much the mass is off. So just to keep that in mind, that's a little bit of a sidebar, but it's, it's a fundamental concept that uh, I think everybody that's been through a uh, physics a two semester physics course should definitely know. All right. So uh, if we want to talk about conservation of energy, you might recall that, hey, uh, we did conservation of energy back like in chapter five, six or seven or somewhere around there. And in that case, you might recall those of you who had me, I had kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial equals work. I mean, plus work in equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final plus e loss plus work out uh stuff like that right that was another form of conservation of energy but it's specifically mechanical energy so if we want to include that this is how we do it we now say again i'm using what your book textbook author likes to do which is he uses delta k plus delta u equals zero that's how he would do conservation of energy mechanical energy problems in chapter seven or whatever chapter it was so if you just added that delta k and that delta u to the same side as the delta e internal now you have a general version of the first law of thermodynamics everybody see that and understand what we're talking about there so hopefully, once you, now that you've seen that, I can make it a little more clear by showing you a specific example. So here's the problem I'm wanting to do as an example. It says a 4.3 gram bullet leaves the barrel with a muzzle velocity of 300.0 meters per second enters a tree and then exits with a speed of 200.0 meters per second. Where did the bullet's kinetic energy go and how much energy was transferred? Okay, so that's the big problem we're trying to solve here. So if you'll notice, you can imagine a scenario where a person's going to uh, do this experiment with a gun. OK, now this is a pretty fast gun. Uh, the muzzle velocity being 300 meters per second means it's approaching the speed of sound. The speed of sound is around 330, and, but it's heavily dependent on temperature. So this is a pretty fast muzzle velocity. Uh, but what you probably want to do is imagine taking a gun, walking up to a tree and really close range, uh, hoping the tree's not so hard that it bullet bounce uh, ricochets and hits you. That, that would be definitely problematic. So I definitely don't recommend anybody doing this. But anyway, you do this in such a way that you shoot it directly at the tree trunk and it's going to go into the tree trunk and then shoot out the other side. Okay. In that little bit of time, 
the potential energy can't change of the bullet. It's not going to get any higher or lower by any significant amount by shooting that far or, or that short of a distance point blank range to the rifle. So I'm going to say Delta U, oops, I'm going to say it in black. Delta U is equal to zero. Also, uh, I'm going to say that the, uh, heat added to the system is going to be zero because the system I'm doing here, I'm using here is going to be the bullet plus the tree. So the bullet and the tree is our system. And therefore any heat would be done over such a small period. It would like come from the sun, say that's going to be negligible. So I'm going to say Q is equal to zero. And in fact, the only work that's happening is the work that maybe the bullet's doing on splitting up the tree and the tree is doing it on the bullet, but that's part of the system. So that's the system acting on itself, which we don't have to take account of. So that means the work is going to be zero as well. So does everybody follow that? All right. And we also know, by the way, that kinetic energy is equal to one half MV squared. And uh, therefore, what I can say is now the first law of thermodynamics becomes delta K plus delta E internal is equal to zero, which gives me that delta E internal is equal to the negative change in kinetic energy. So the internal energy change of the system, which remember includes the bullet and the tree, is going to be the negative of K final minus K initial. Well, K final is actually both of them have a common factor of one half. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the one half and the M out in front so i'm going to say one half and then the mass of the bullet is 0 0.0043 kilograms remember in the si system if you're using an equation made for the si system mass is supposed to be uh, used as kilograms so that's why i had to convert that to kilograms and now i'm going to say times v final squared which would be 200.0 meters per second squared minus 300.0 meters per second squared like that so uh this is basically v final squared and this is v initial squared so you can see that it does in fact look like what i originally said which is k final minus k initial so i'm gonna say negative 0.00, .00 uh, 215 kilograms times 200 squared would be 40,000 meters squared per second squared minus 90,000 meters squared per second squared like that you can see that's clearly negative 50,000 and the negative times the negative is going to give me positive so I'm going to take 50,000 and multiply it by 0 0.00215 and that gives me positive 107 Point five. Now, technically speaking, I only had two sig figs up there, and uh, really that that pretty much nails it. So these two are extra sig figs, and that comes out in joules. So evidently, the kinetic energy, because the question was specifically, uh, where did the bullet's kinetic energy go? Well, the bullet's kinetic energy was converted from mechanical kinetic energy of the system, specifically the me mechanical kinetic energy of the bullet itself, uh, went into the internal energy of the system, which means uh, both the bullet and the tree heated up. 
Okay. Now that's not all though. I mean, it would definitely get hot if you've ever picked up a, even just a shell casing after a bullet's been fired, much less an actual, uh, round if you pick up either, either of those right after they've been fired they will burn you they're they're quite hot so you would find for instance the tree to be quite hot you'd find the uh bullet to be quite hot but you'd also find the tree somewhat mangled so some of the energy went in destroying the structure of the tree you know separating fibers of wood and all that good stuff so all of that went into an increase in internal energy any questions on that All right, so that's the more general version of the first law of thermodynamics to include mechanical energy. Uh, and this is a really big thing. Remember, we, we couldn't do this without James Prescott Joule because before James, uh, before Joule came along with his mechanical equivalent of heat, they thought heat in calories was an entirely different and unrelated quantity to mechanical energy that we would call uh, be, being measured in joules. OK, so they, they thought those were not transferable to each other, but this is showing you exactly how they are related to each other. So hopefully that helps a little bit uh, better. You better understand this. So now in order to continue on, a big part of thermodynamics in general is there's a buttload of terminology. Uh, if you ever take a thermodynamics class, there will be certain chapters where you'll just have to memorize, you know, at least seven or eight different terms. Uh, ultimately, through the whole course, you're going to have to memorize a lot of different things like Gibbs free energy, the Gibbs Duhem potential. All these different things are just going to pop up, uh, and uh, you're just going to have to know those. So this is also the same sort of scenario. We're starting the, the process of thermodynamics in physics, and in order to function in thermodynamics, you have to know certain terms. So uh, I've written them all down here. One of them is a heat reservoir. You might also know of it as a heat sink. Okay. So what you might imagine is, let's say that you've found uh, a piece of metal and the piece of metal has a temperature of 13.0 degrees Celsius. And you find it laying outside right next to a lake. And then you walk over to the lake, you take your th thermometer and turns out that it also has a temperature of 13.7 degrees Celsius. Well, then you could, in principle, take that little block of metal and submerge it in that lake. And that will keep the block of metal at a fixed temperature. In that sense the lake is acting as a heat reservoir. So a heat reservoir is something that never changes its temperature, no matter how much heat you take out of it or how much heat you put into it. Into it. Now, in principle, theoretically, we know any amount of heat added to a lake will cause a very, very, very small uh, change in temperature. But that's like out in so many decimal places that it's one, not measurable, but two, probably not even practical because uh, it, it's never, ever going to be able to uh, distribute itself thoroughly enough to hit all the molecules. So it's probably never going to go up. But just thinking in, in the most basic terms, you could imagine a scenario where it did. So that's what a heat reservoir is. It, you normally just treat it as if it's so big that it just can't change temperature. And, and that works pretty well. OK, you're going to run into that when we talk about heat engines, because uh, heat engines, you'll assume they have a temperature from which their fuel was or their working substance came and then a, another heat reservoir into which their exhaust uh, working material will be expelled. So that's where that comes in. There's also a process called quasi static. Uh, it turns out, by the way, if you try to take thermodynamic quantities, like if you're talking about pressure or volume or temperature for an ideal gas or something like that, you can't really graph those at all unless there's they're in equilibrium. The reason being is there's no way to actually define what the temperature is for a gas that's not in equilibrium. The gas in equilibrium has to have a a uh, mean value of the kinetic energy, for instance, the longitude, or excuse me, the uh, 
translational kinetic energy of all the molecules has to have some average and uh, it has to be a somewhat normally distributed uh, dispersion of energy like we learned in the Maxwell uh, equation or the Maxwell, it's not an equation, but it's called the, the Maxwell distribution. So if it's not like that, it's not an equilibrium. And if it's not an equilibrium, we can't actually put it on a graph. So a quasi-static process is a process where you go from point A to point B through a series. And often you have to do so very slowly through a series of equilibrium positions. In some sense, it's almost impossible or, or essentially impossible to have a quasi-static process, okay? But if you find an area of science where you can assume something behaves like it's quasi-static, then that can be a very powerful tool. So you can imagine it just going so slow that you you take it from point A, which is our starting point, and you only change it an infinitesimal amount. And then you wait however long it takes for equilibrium to reestablish. And you only pay attention to it there. And then you do it again, just another infinitesimal change, wait for equilibrium to establish and take it there and keep on doing that until you get to B. That's what a quasi-static process is. I want to remind you that heat is a transfer of energy due to a difference in temperature. That's the definition of heat. It's not something you own or something a system has. It's something that can be uh, given to a system or removed from a system. But once it's given to a system, it just becomes part of the eternal energy, internal energy. Okay. Similarly, work is a transfer of energy via mechanical processes. So compressing things uh, are hitting things, uh, uh, basically giving them uh, kinetic energy through collisions, uh, lifting them up, giving them potential energy, that kind of thing. All of those different things are mechanical processes, uh, which transfers energy from one thing to the system or away from the system. A thermodynamic process is an action that can lead to a change in the state of a system. So the state of a system is... Uh, <laughs> That's kind of a weird thing to define. It's one of those things that's so open-ended, it's too too difficult to define because of the open-endedness. But what we mean is uh, if you're looking at a gas, uh, let's say you, you had the time to do an infinity of experiments with a gas, okay? If you found that a certain number of variables were required for you to get a gas in a certain way so that you could do an experiment, then that number of variables is important. And each of those variables is called a state variable. But what you discover is that when you have that number of state variables, let's say four, okay, when you have four state variables, you know that every experiment you do on that gas will end up exactly the same as every other experiment done with that gas as long as those state variables are set accordingly. Okay, so that's what we mean by uh, a thermodynamic process is basically uh, a, a way of changing the state variables of a system through some open-ended process. And then, like I said, the state variables are sort of the minimum number of required variables for you to convince yourself that, hey, if I have these four or five variables set, then I know every experiment I do with this gas, with those variables set at those values, will all turn out exactly the same. If they don't turn out exactly the same, then the original state was not the same, and therefore you didn't have enough state variables. Okay, so hopefully that that helps you better understand a little bit about state variables uh, and it could be for anything. You know, we're talking about gases. So I gave you the examples of E internal pressure, volume, temperature, mass, R. And, and I really should say mass R number of moles. You don't have to have both of those. In fact, that's redundant. So in this case, you really only need. Uh, well, if you were dealing with an ideal gas, you wouldn't even need E internal in there. But if you're not dealing with an I, ideal gas, then you need E internal, P, V, and T, and either M or N, and that's more than enough. Well, I should say that's sufficient. However, you also see 
somewhere along the line, some physicists were able to compute an equation of state for a rubber band. And that's a nice example because it shows you all the variables that a rubber band needs to firmly define its state. And it turns out it's like temperature, tension, and I think that's it. Uh, yeah, I think I can't remember. I, I don't recall any other variables, but I think it's just, oh, the length, the tension, the length, and uh, the temperature. That's all that matters. So those are all the state variables for the uh, for a rubber band. All right. So those are some sort of regular everyday terms that we use a lot, uh, but they're fairly vague. And that's on purpose because we want them to cover a lot of different things. Now, separating all that and making an actual thermodynamic process, here's some types of thermodynamic processes. Uh, isothermal, I guess you all can probably guess what that is. So T is equal to a constant. Now, that's what isothermal means. It, any process in which you hold the temperature constant, which could be done by uh, making sure it's in contact with a heat reservoir or stuff like that, or it might just happen so quickly that the temperature doesn't have enough time to change. That's what happens when a, a, a vial of fuel or diesel fuel air mixture explodes in a piston. Uh, there's an explosion and the temperature can't change that rapidly. Uh, definitely the heat can't flow that rapidly, but that's a, a case in point. Now, since the T is a constant, that means for an ideal gas, which I'll just abbreviate IG, this implies delta E internal has to be equal to zero. Remember last time I, I showed you guys that the internal energy for an ideal gas is either three halves NRT, or, uh, and that's lowercase n, or three halves N, capital N, KT, right? So the only parameter an ideal gas uh, internal energy depends on is temperature. So that's what happens here. And therefore, Q is equal to W. So that's what an isothermal process is. And that's some of the uh, interesting things that can come from that. Another thing that can come from that is since work is equal to the integral of P dV and P is equal to N times R times T over V times dV, if it's a fixed volume of gas, whoa, hold on, hold on, N equals a constant two, then you can have N times R times T times the integral dV over V, which equals N R T times the natural log of V final over V initial. So that's another ramification for an isothermal process. In this case, it's specifically with an ideal gas. And I had to, to do that last part, I had to also assume that it was a fixed amount of gas. In other words, I had a fixed number of moles of gas. Okay. Uh, adiabatic process is one in which Q is equal to zero. Now, that means specifically that heat cannot flow into or out of the system. So that's what an adiabatic process is. And from the first law of thermodynamics, that tells us that delta E internal has to equal the negative of the work done. So that's one of the, one of the parameters that uh, are one of the results of an adiabatic process. We'll also learn in the next chapter that you have another version of sort of the ideal gas law that applies when it's adiabatic, and it's this one. Again, for an ideal gas, P1 V1 to the gamma power is equal to P2 V2 to the gamma power, where gamma is defined to be C P over CV. I really should have checked that to make sure, but I'm 
pretty confident that's what it is. Uh, let me double check. I can't. Sometimes I make a careless mistake and do the CV over CP or CP over CV. So uh, just to make sure I'm not screwing up on that, I want to double check. I think it's in this chapter. I know it's in 20, but I think it's also in this one. Okay, I'll just put a question mark by it to keep an eye, uh, for you to keep an eye on it. But use that's gamma. That's what I'm raising the the volume. Uh, that's the exponent I'm putting on the volume in that equation. So when you have an adiabatic process, uh, Q has to equal zero, which means the first law of thermodynamics gives us E internal is equal to the negative of the work done. And... Uh, then for an ideal gas, you get this extra equation. Isobaric, I bet you can probably guess what that means. So isobaric, if you are familiar with the uh, term bar, which is a unit of pressure, yes, that's right, Micah, uh, then you know that isobaric means constant pressure. So this is P equals a constant, oh, let me write it in the red like I've been doing so it'll jump out. Actually, I should probably switch them and do red one and then blue one. So uh, this is P equals a constant, not an constant. So P is equal to a constant. Now that doesn't necessarily give you much. I mean, there's no P in the first law of thermodynamics, so we're not going to get anything fancy with that. Uh, but what we can do is we can realize work is equal to the integral of P dV. And since P is a constant, that's just the integral of dV. So you get work is just equal to P times delta V. So that's another expression that can come in handy when the pressure is a constant. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that jumps out. Uh, nothing that I can think of, so... Yep, and I also made it to the part of the book where I thought the gamma was, and I still don't see it defining gamma as CP or CV or vice versa, so I couldn't even check that, but that's okay. Still don't see it. All right. Another one is isovolumetric, which is easy, but if I had read the other version, uh, I don't think y'all would have liked that too much. Isochoric. So isochoric and isovolumetric both mean the same thing. Uh, that means uh, V is equal to a constant. So since V is equal to a constant, that there's no V in the first law of thermodynamics, so we can't really do much there. But again, we do have uh, a work equation, and work is equal to the integral of P dV. But since the volume is a constant, the work has to be zero. So now we have an expression that says delta E internal is just equal to Q. So that's a ramification of uh, isovolumetric or isochoric. Any questions on that one? So all of this stuff will come in uh, handy when we start into chapter 20 and we start talking about uh, heat engines and stuff like that and we start doing some more robust stuff with actual uh, ideal gas laws and that sort of thing so uh it, it like right now it's kind of boring but i just wanted to let you know these are some of the ramifications that come from it and your book will go through even more details uh talking about what these uh different processes are and some of the results of it and it does basically the same thing i'm doing which is work out a derivation uh, I didn't actually show you the derivation of work is equal to the integral of PDV, but I'm getting ready to, so don't worry too much about that. All right, so turn to the next page. There's two more processes that become uh, important. The reversible one's not even mentioned until chapter 20, but I just can't, you know, do this entourage, this onslaught of uh, various terms without introducing uh, reversible as well. So first one is a free expansion. So this is basically, if you could imagine like two aquariums, but like, you know, fish aquariums, but with the lids on 
And let's imagine that you had a connecting tunnel or a connecting pipe from one aquarium to the other that had a valve on it that was a perfect valve so it wouldn't let anything pass. And then you suck out all the air in one of the aquariums and the other aquarium just has the atmospheric gas or whatever gas you want to put in it. Now, if you open that valve and allow that gas to slowly pour into that vacuumed out empty container, which is literally a vacuum, supposedly, then that's what we call a free expansion. It's supposed to be uh, when a gas is allowed to expand in volume adiabatically, so no heat should be transferred into or out of the gas without doing any work. It can't do work. And the way we made sure it didn't do work was the gas was expanding against the vacuum. So the pressure was zero. Okay. So that's what a free expansion is. That turns out to be something kind of important later. Uh, and then finally, reversible. A process is con uh, a process considered to be carried out infinitely slowly so that at each point it is in, a, a, it is an equilibrium state, i.e. it's quasi-static and carried out such that the whole process can be done in reverse without any changes in the work done or heat exchanged. So you can imagine something like uh, maybe we allow gas to flow into a piston and then we crank our bicycle crank and that piston uh, pushes down the gas uh, to compress it and then an explosion happens and then we keep pedaling the pedal and that allows the gas to leave and then another sample of gas comes in, so on and so forth. If it's reversible, then I can also run it backwards and the same thing will happen. But you can see if if it's not truly reversible, then, uh, or let's say it this way, if there was friction present, we would put a certain amount of friction in when we're going one way and an entirely different amount of friction the other way. And because of that, it can't be reversible because the energies would actually change. The energy exchanged when the piston went in and when the piston compressed and all that stuff. Uh, all that stuff wouldn't be reversible. So in reality, there's, it's impossible to actually make a reversible process. The, the, as luck would have it, in nature, it turns out that we can make processes come somewhat close to reversible and we can always treat them as an ideal scenario. So what we can do is we can imagine, at least imagine, heat engines that are completely reversible. And because they're completely reversible, they won't have any friction or stuff like that. So then in that sense, they're a completely ideal machine. And they, when you calculate their efficiency, would have the absolute best efficiency possible. And in fact, their efficiency would be impossible to reach because you'd have to have a frictionless reversible process to reach it. So that's why we use them. So it turns out it doesn't really harm you that bad by not uh, actually existing. It just gives us sort of like a goal, like Galileo imagined uh, that an object rolling up a very gradual incline would essentially roll forever in trying to reach its original height or if the if the, it wasn't even gradual if it was level so just like a, a Galileo was able to imagine that scenario we're able to imagine a scenario of a reversible engine and therefore treat it like a holy grail to compare all other engines to any questions on that all right well that's actually all I had to cover for you today. I may be putting some more videos up uh, tomorrow or this weekend. Uh, so keep an eye on my YouTube channel. Also, right now, before I let you guys go, I would like everybody in attendance to please uh, send me a chat of your first and last name. So please do that. That's what I'm doing for roll. I had a way where it was keeping that automatically. I can't find that way anymore and it's not keeping track. So please, each one of you go ahead and send me your name. I'll have that in the sheet. So I'll know you're here. And if you're, uh, have a friend that's in the room with you, like, uh, sometimes I have a couple of students will get together and, and do a, a room meeting, uh, put everybody's name in there for me. That would be greatly appreciated. 
So uh, other than that, you guys are free to go. Make sure you get your test done. You've got a test that's due on the 30th. Make sure you get that, that online test done. Uh, I do want you to get a good score. You're actually allowed an infinite number of trials and only your highest counts. Uh, also remember the average of all your practice tests counts towards your final course grade in that I take the highest of each and divide that grade by tw uh, the average of all those. I divide that by 20 and that many points is added to your course grade. I'll wait for the last person to leave in case anybody has any questions. Other than that, you're free to go. Thank you for coming, everybody. Still need more people to type your name in. Oh, it looks like I got more than I thought I had. Okay. If you didn't type your name in the chat, please do so before leaving. Anybody else have any questions? Michael, Brandon, Richard? All right. I didn't see you type any messages, Richard or Michael. Uh, it looks like you might not even be here because you didn't send me your name. So I guess that's it. Bye, everyone.